when it comes to becoming a police officer, a lot of things are changing these days, especially where they're putting emphasis on what's important through the hiring process. A lot of departments are transitioning over to the psychological exam, holding most of the weight when it comes to part of your conditional offer or part of your conditional hiring. Let's discuss. Understanding the psychological exam is complicated, it's tricky, but don't worry, I have that gift down below for you, the getting started as a police officer, free workshop, go ahead, sign up for it, it's going to walk you through, and we do a great breakdown in it of the psychological exam to get you started, to get your foot in the door, understand what it is that you're going to have to deal with, and some of the actual questions that you may have to deal with, depending on what psychological exam you have. Also, if you have something more specific to yourself, that other gift, the free coaching call with myself is down below. I'd be happy to sit down and talk with you and discuss whatever specific to your hiring process, any questions you have, any concerns you have, help you work through it, help you get started on that right path and get you to your ultimate goal of becoming a police officer or a law enforcement officer. So let's dive in here. Your psychological exam. How much weight does it carry? Is it important? Is it just a check in the box? If you would have asked me 10 years ago, I would have told you it's important and it matters, but it was more of a, just a requirement and individuals were, were really just going through and making sure that there was no major red flags in your psychological exam or your psychological background. Now, now a lot more emphasis is being put on your psychological exam. And the reason for that is because departments are starting to really isolate where they want their officers, or I should say their candidates focused on. And so polys are still there. They still matter, but a lot of departments are switching and putting more emphasis on psychological exams. Some departments are even getting rid of polys altogether and they'd rather you have one or two sessions with a psychologist to discuss your answers and go over whichever tests they give you. And yes, there are multiple tests. So let's kind of cover what the tests are first. So first you have the thematic apperception test, which is the TAT. It's a very common psychological exam that a lot of police officers have went through. I would say it's kind of more, it's not the original, but it's more of the known one that you will see or you will hear about when it comes to older police officers, police officers that have had to take this test, you know, maybe five, 10 years ago, it's still being used. Officers still have to go through this all the time and it's still, it's still relevant, right? There's still a lot of questions in it, but it's one of the tests that you may have to have to do, depending on what department you apply to. The other test is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, MMPI, and it is a mouthful, I know, but psychologists and psychologists, they're doctors, they, they figure they put a big name on it and it sells or whatever the reason. Anyway, it's called the MMPI. Now, we're going to discuss this as the TAT and the MMPI, but know that there's an MMPI-1 and an MMPI-2. You might have to take both. The MMPI-2, and that's the one we're pretty much going to be covering, is just an extension of the MMPI-1, right? So it, there's more questions in it, and and they kind of they kind of push a little bit more on specific events in your life. But for the main reasons and the main part of this discussion, we're just going to be focusing on calling them the TAT and the MMPI. And we're really focusing on the MMPI too, because that's the one that's used predominantly now, but you may see the MMPI one. It doesn't matter whatever your testing booklet says, they're going to be pretty identical. So right off the bat, the TAT, the TAT is based on, and both of these are really kind of based on this model, but the TAT is going to ask you questions, repetitive questions written in a different order and to see how you answer. And they want to see one, are you truthful? But it's not, it's not necessarily being truthful. It's, are you consistent? If you say that you are not a social individual, and then you say on another one, Hey, I love to, I have, you know, five drinks a week with friends on five different nights. Those things don't really add up and they're going to create flags. Now, 
the same thing applies to the MMPI. They have questions such as that, but that's how the TAT works. And now the TAT can, can range from a multitude of questions. So the TAT, the most I've ever seen on the TAT is just under 800 questions. The least amount I've ever seen given on a TAT is right around the 400 and some odd number question mark. So it's a long, extensive process, right? The most I've ever seen on an MMPI is up around like 1200 questions, right? So it's, they're extensive. When you go to do your psychological exam, you have to block off an extensive amount of time. I'm talking hours, enough time to complete the test because once you start, you really can't stop. And then you also got to sit down with a psychologist afterwards and they need to review it and then have an actual in-person interview with you. Now, these days, everyone's trying to do things online and virtually, and, and maybe you will get something along those lines, but most of the time, they're going to want to have you there at their testing center or at their testing location, their office right? So that you can't sit there and answer the questions with anyone else, right? They're not going to send it to you at the, at your house. They may, but it's not likely. The other aspect that you have to consider is once you complete this test, they're going to run it through a machine. It's going to say, Hey, these are the inconsistencies or the examiner, right? Who is a actually certified doctor is going to look at their key points that they like to look at and say, hey, where's this person jump out at, depending on how proficient they are with the exam and the test they've given you. A lot of times these tests are done independent. You're not going to be sitting next to anyone. You're going to be in a, a room by yourself. They, I mean, you can use the restroom, of course. They're not going to deny you that, but it's it, they don't they don't prefer it. They prefer you to just sit down for the hours on end and complete the test. If you need to get up, stretch your legs, they understand. But for the most part, they just want you to sit down and knock out the test. Like anything you're doing, you're going to want to show up looking professional. I'm not saying that you have to be in a suit and tie, but definitely some nice slacks or dress pants and a button up shirt, something along those lines, nice dress shoes. Um, if you want to wear a tie, that's fine. If you want to wear a jacket and tie, that's fine too. Just know that you're going to be sitting down for anywhere from three to five hours, three to five hours covering this. And it's such an extensive part of the hiring process. Now we had to add it in to our getting hired as a law enforcement officer training course, because it's one of those things we see more and more people getting denied and disqualified for their psychological exam. And that was one of the main reasons we decided to add it into our online training course, getting hired as a police officer. It was just such an extensive and, and heavily weighted aspect of the hiring process, we couldn't deny it. And we had to add in both, both sides of the test, the MMPI and the TAT and, and the questions that are going to be asked just because of how much weight departments are putting on these psychological exams. Now, just due to the fact of where the, the country is going and due to the fact of where, where the law enforcement career is going, they want to make sure they have well-secured, mentally strong officers to go out there and and serve their communities. So when you look at this, look at this test as there's no right answer, but there are wrong answers. There's no right answer, but there are wrong answers. And what I mean by there's no right answer is as long as you're consistent in it and you're not trying to game the test where you're saying, oh, I don't think they want to hear this, or I don't think they want to hear this. Like, oh yeah, I'm very social. And then they say, how often do you go out with friends? And but they might throw a curve in there. How often do you go out with friends to a party? Oh, I, I don't party. All right. But then it says over here that you're social. Now that's going to create a flag and you're going to have to see that in the, in the actual Scantron or whatever they use to, to measure the test. And your evaluator is going to look at that and say, Hey, you're going to have to explain this and everything that has a flag on it, you're going to have to explain Perfect example for me. I always get flagged on this no matter what. How many guns do you own? A is zero. B is one to two. C is three to four. And then D is greater than four. And I always mark greater than four because trust me, you don't want to lie. And you mark greater than four every single time pops a flag. And then I go in to meet with the examiner, the doctor, and he or she says, hey, you know, I see here you own a lot of firearms. Why is that? 
And depending on their personal, now remember, there's always human bias, right? There's always a human error, I want to say in this, whether they're a doctor or not, doesn't matter. And I've, I've seen this in my actual exams, my personal exams, where you see individuals who really, for, for this example, don't really care about firearms. You see, and then you see other individuals who are not, say, pro-firearm or who hate firearms, we'll just put it that way. And they're they're really coming at me. I mean, like almost attacking me for how many firearms I own. You don't want to say, oh, I competitively shoot, although that's not a bad answer, but you want to stay away from that. You don't you definitely don't want to say something along the lines of, oh, I just I love I love firearms. I love firearms. I'm a big firearm enthusiast, XYZ. You want to stay away from something like that too. Even if you do, that's that's just not a proper answer for someone who's who's trying to obtain a professional job, especially a professional job that requires them to have a firearm on their hip all the time. So for me, it's a very simple answer. And it's an answer that works every single time because it's one, it's the truth. And two, it it's professional. And what I tell them is, Hey, I'm a law enforcement instructor. I'm an instructor in firearms. I have to be proficient in multiple different platforms of firearms. So therefore I own multiple different platforms of firearms so that I can properly instruct it. And that's it. I'm specific, like I always say, but I don't elaborate. I just say, Hey, I'm a firearms instructor. I need to be proficient in multiple different platforms so I can instruct those platforms. And therefore I own those platforms just so I can properly instruct them. And that's it. I don't need to go into detail that I competitively shoot at some point or that I grew up with firearms or that it's a misunderstanding. No, I don't need to go into all that. Just a professional answer of, of why I own firearms or why I own more than four firearms. So these are the things you're going to have to look at. These are the things that may pop a flag, something, something that's not illegal, right? Some, hey, you own firearms. It's not illegal. I'm allowed to own firearms. I legally own firearms, but it pops a flag and and it it's had me every single time it's popped a flag. And other times it's had me have doctors or examiners come at me very aggressively. And you just need to remain calm. You need to de-escalate the situation, right? And because you can read the tone of individuals and understand what are they really trying to ask or what's the what's the proper professional answer that that needs to be given here. So why why do I have this? If you mark, as we're going to go back to, hey, I am a very social individual, but I don't go out with friends, and say that pops a flag. Well, why why don't you go out with friends? Well, and I'm not saying I don't go out with friends, but it said go out with friends and party. I interpreted that, and you can explain that. I interpreted that as to mean I go out drinking and partying with friends, and that's not what I do. I'll get together with friends and. We'll go golfing or we'll take out the families and go get ice cream or go get dinner together. But I don't go out partying with friends. You know, I'm a, I'm a father or, or maybe you're a mother or whatever. And you just explain, like, that's just not what we do. It's not what we enjoy. So that's how I interpreted the question. And if you can explain how you interpreted the question and it's logical, you have nothing to worry about. But these are the type of things that you're going to see on these tests. Now, the difference between the two, the TAT, as I said before, is going to be more of a more of a analysis of of just a general analysis. I should put it that way. It's it's not going to dive too much into your psyche. Whereas the MP or the MMPI is is a is a personality test. It's really going to dig into your personality. It's going to, most of it's going to be personality based questions, questions that pertain directly to, to who you are as an individual. The, the TAT is going to ask kind of more general questions for how you respond to certain situations, such as, do you drink alcohol? And if you do, how many drinks do you have a week? Right? So it's going to ask you a generalized question such as that. And the MMPI will get to those questions as well, but it's a little bit more invasive, whereas it is say, how do you feel after you've had three or four drinks? Or do you feel the need to have four, three or four drinks? Really diving into you. I mean, it's it's targeting and you can and you can kind of get that vibe when you start reading the questions. You start to understand, hey, this is it's an invasive test, right? It's invasive into your mind. It's it's trying to dig out and pull out any type of 
flags that a law enforcement agency may have. I'm not telling you to lie on it. You definitely don't need to lie on it, but you definitely can see the pattern in both of these tests of questions they're going to ask you. If one question asks you over here, let's go to the MMPI issue. How do you feel about the affairs of the government? Right. And, and you say, you know, you have a scale and, and it's broken down to A, B, C or D. And in that it's, you know, one to two, I agree, three to four, I, or one to two, I strongly agree, three to four, I agree, five's neutral, and you know where I'm going, then disagree at the other end, 10, I disagree, and you mark neutral, right, uh, neutral, and then another question down the line is going to ask you, how do you feel about our current president, right, or how do you feel about the defense budget spending, right? Anything like that, anything that can can correlate to that original question. And you say something completely different. Oh, I 110% disagree, right? Or over here in the first question you marked, I 100% agree with our the way our government's being run. And over here it says, I completely disagree with the amount of defense budget spending. Those are the same question, and you need to be able to isolate that. That's that's the way to get through your psychological exam. You need to be able to isolate those questions and understand where it where you're going to fall on it and how that's going to trip a red flag. And if you're thinking like, oh, perfect answer, I'm going to go neutral on both. Well, maybe it won't have a neutral answer on both, right? Maybe you have to pick, and this happens on a lot of questions, maybe you have to pick one or you know one or the other and you don't you don't get a choice they don't give you uh a neutral choice but if you're thinking like oh, i'm just going to pick neutral on both you may pick neutral on both and then that may still pop a question and say hey i see here that you're indifferent right your your examiner might say i see that you're indifferent to to the way that the country currently is and they say well you know, could you elaborate on that? Right now, these are psychologists, right? Or psychiatrists and, or I'm sorry, psychologists. And they're going to ask you to elaborate. This is what they do. They pry and they dig. Why are you indifferent to the way the government currently is? You don't agree with it or you just don't care. What What is it? And they may start throwing out things like that to, to kind of stimulate. Well, well I'm not saying I don't care. I'm just saying, I think things could be better. I think things can be worse, right? But then if you dive into that, well, how can things be worse or how could things be better? And you're just kind of driving yourself or digging that ditch just a little bit deeper when you start answering like that. So once again, if you're going to go neutral, you have to stay neutral. Oh, well, you know, it's just like anything else. Life is about balance and, you know, nothing's perfect, but, you know, I'm neutral. I think, you know, we are where we are, and I'm I'm just trying to do my part to to keep the country, you know, moving forward and and in a good place. Specific, but you didn't elaborate. You didn't say, Oh, I, I completely disagree with the way law enforcement is being run and I want to be the one that makes the change. Yeah, noble answer. Noble answer. Not something you want to say to to a examiner who holds your or I should say, ha has the potential of ruining your chances of getting hired as a law enforcement officer. Plus, their exam is going to be open record from that point on because you're going to sign a release of uh, information for every uh, department you apply to. So don't think like, oh, patient confidentiality. No, no, no. The individuals that are paying for this are, are their employee, right? That's their client. So you, on the other hand, they get access to that final report and they're allowed to release that report to other departments if departments contact them with a signed release of information. And if you think, oh, I just won't sign a release of information for a police department, they're just not going to hire you. And if you can go down whatever legal aspect you want, but they'll come up with some type of solution as to why you are not a candidate for that department. If you don't sign a release of information, you just can't get around it. And that's something you're out to do. So if you think your psych exam won't follow you, if you mess up on one, it will follow you and you just got to, got to learn. And that's, that's what we're doing here, helping you learn 
how to deal with each phase of these hiring process. That's what we do in our coaching clients, our one-on-one coaching, our group coaching, and our online course, our self-paced online course, getting hired as a police officer. That's the whole purpose of it. That's why we developed those four candidates so that we could get good candidates through these tough screening processes. One of the most tough ones being the psychological exam, especially nowadays with the emphasis and the weight that's being put on it. It's no longer just, hey, I'm a pretty sound minded individual. I have nothing to worry about. Well, now the examiners are really diving deep into what is coming through when it comes to candidates. All right. So backing backing up here. So we understand the TAT is a pretty general exam. A lot of questions, but a pretty general exam where the MMPI or the MMPI2 is really diving into your personality. It's really trying to, it's not one of these personality tests that you take on on the internet that puts you into a category. This is going to put you into a category and it's going to break that category down even further, break it down even further. And then it's going to pop out all these potential flags you may have. Now it's not actually saying that you failed, but it's going to pop out all these potential flags and each one, the examiner is going to have to go through one by one and see what you mean and make notes. And you have no idea what note they're making behind that clipboard. So you don't know if it's positive. You don't know if it's good. You don't know if they're saying, Hey, that, that question was, was wrong. This individual just misinterpreted. And I've, I've had to say that multiple times. It's like, Hey, I interpreted this question as X, Y, Z. I don't go, well, why'd you interpret it as X, Y, Z? It's just how I read it. I, I mean, if I read it right now, that's how I read it. If, if I read it with your connotation put on it, I understand the meaning behind it. But if, if I was just to read this outright over and over again, that's that's the understanding I have behind it. And then that's it. And you just give your answer as to why you answered it based on that. Hopefully it's a reasonable answer. Remember, everything in law enforcement is based on reasonableness. So hopefully it's a reasonable answer. And the examiner is just like, okay, not an issue moving on to the next one. Now with the MMPI, as I said, it's going to be invasive. And I don't care who you are. You get up around a 600 question mark and you've answered 600 questions and you're three hours in, you're dying, right? This is a marathon. This is not a sprint. This is definitely a marathon. And this is one of the harder mental exams that you have because you cannot mess up. This is not an exam where you can miss a question and then bubble fill back and be off a whole whole row of questions because you were just mentally fatigued. You need to go into this alert, a good night's sleep the night prior, Pro- possibly, you know, if you have an exam prep course, like what's in our, our online training course, review that, and then give yourself maybe a day break to mentally decompress and then go into your exam. You want to make sure it's just like you're studying for a big test for school. You want to make sure you eat right and you're well hydrated the night and morning of because you're going to be sitting in there bring some water with you they're probably not going to let you bring coffee or anything like that in there but if you have a clear water bottle bring a clear water bottle they'll they'll most likely allow that you're going to want one now as i said before they will let you use the restroom but a lot of times they don't allow cell phones they don't allow they don't allow anything that may allow you to cheat and once again you can't really cheat on the test so much as just ask for assistance but they're just, they're really stringent about the the way they run the tests. And it doesn't seem like that. It just seems like you're going to come in. They're going to explain the test to you. They're going to tell you to read the directions and answer the, the questions accordingly. And then come get them when you're done or if you need anything. And it seems very relaxed and, and very cordial. But at the same point, if you start needing to ask for stuff, if you're taking a long time, And I mentioned this in the training workshop, you don't want to sign up. You don't want to be the person that gets an exam at one o'clock on a Friday. You don't, you don't want to be that person that starts their exam one o'clock on a Friday, spends four hours doing it. And then the doctor still needs to see you at five when they're, when they want to leave, they're already not going to be in a good mood with you because they want to go home. It's a Friday. They're humans too. So if you can, when you get your chance to schedule your exam, schedule it immediately, schedule it for earlier in the week. If you can take off of work, as I've said before, on these hiring positions or hiring process, take off of work if you have to, 
it's this is a career you're working for. You don't want to blow it because you got on someone's bad side. And once again, there's human error in everything. So even doctors can be frustrated and can be tired and fatigued at the end of a long week. And the last thing they want to be doing is sitting around waiting for someone to get done a 600 question test. It's three o'clock on a Friday and you're only at question 300. And they're saying like, oh man, it's going to take them another two hours to finish this, these other 300 questions. And then we got to sit down and do an exam with them. I'm not getting out here till six, six thirty because then I got to write up the report on it and get it over to the police department. Don't be that person. If they, ex if they assign it to you and that's what you get, that's what you get. But if you have the chance to schedule your own exams, which a lot of times you do make sure you schedule a proper time. If you, if you schedule a bad time and it comes back to bite you, can't say I didn't warn you. So your MMPI, jumping back to your MMPI, as I said, invasive, they're going to ask you to, to elaborate not only on the state of how you feel about the, the military, but what's your relationship with your, your family? You know, do you have anyone in your family who you don't speak to? Do you have anyone in your family that you're really close to? Have you ever had a family disturbance? You know, do you, have you ever lost a loved one? These are all invasive questions that they ask. How did it make you feel? If if have you ever lost a loved one? D is is no, and then on a scale of one to ten, how did it make you feel on sadness? Well, how are you supposed to you know put sadness on a lost loved one? What's what's the right answer? Like oh, you know, I lost a I lost a cousin and or I lost a grandparent, right? And I I was a it was a one to three, right? It was a one to three. And I, you know, I wasn't very close with them or I lost a grandparent and it was a, it was a nine, like it was devastating. Well, there you go. That nine or that one to three might pop a flag or maybe that neutral might pop a flag. Like why, why did you feel this way when you lost your grandparents? Now you're going to have to explain this. I, you know, I never, I never met my grandparents or I only got to see them once a year during Christmas. We never had a strong relationship just because my, my family never lived close to them. specific, but I'm not elaborating. I'm not going into the, well, my parents just never had good relationships with them. And that carried over to us. And they were always arguing. And anytime that they wanted to come see us, my parents said no. So they just didn't try hard enough. And that's elaborating. You want to stay away from that. If, if it's something along those lines, my, you know, my family just didn't have a, uh, they lived far away and my family just, we didn't see them all the time. So we just really talked on, on holidays and, you know, we loved them, but we just didn't get to see them all the time. And I guess that's kind of what I was thinking when I answered end of story. That's it. You know, it was human. You weren't, you weren't a robot. You were, weren't saying, you know, oh, I would just, we just didn't see them. End of story. No, I mean, if you're going to mark like, oh, it, it bothered me a little bit, but not a lot. You still, you're still human. You still have to convey the emotions proper or properly for, for the scenario or for the situation, I should say. If you're, if you're looking at the MMPI and you're thinking this is an exhaustive test, it 100% is, and you need to be prepared for it as I was mentioning earlier. So don't spend too much time on what are the questions so much as I need to go in there, I need to be prepared, and I need to answer the questions as to what a reasonable person would answer. So listen, down below are those two gifts, as I mentioned before, if you're really looking at at getting into law enforcement, you have to take our getting started workshop, especially when it comes to the psychological exam. We actually go over a little bit more about the questions in there throughout the training. Also, if you have something specific about yourself or your situation, maybe you're already in the process and you're thinking, man, I have this coming up. I need to talk to someone about it because as I said, they're never there to really help you. And they, there's really nothing out there to help you, which is why we started this. Reach out to me, set up a coaching call. I'd love to help you do everything I can to get you to have that nice shiny badge put on your chest. Get comes with the authority, which I know you're going to be able to handle the respect that comes with it and the responsibility that comes with it because we need good police officers out there. As always, stay safe and I will see you next time.